Good evening, everybody. Whoa, that is loud. I woke you guys up. Good evening, everybody. My name is Noe Magana. I'm content manager for Benito Link. I would like to begin by thanking all of you guys for being here with us tonight, and also the candidates for making the time to be here. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Brett Redman Transportation, Golden Memorial, Phil Foster Pinnacle Organics, Wright Brothers Industrial Supply, Richard Shelton Insurance Marketing, the Rotary Club of San Juan Bautista, SBC Cosmetic Care, and True Value Hardware. Before we begin, please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent as a courtesy to the audience. Benito Link has been hosting election forums to provide residents with an opportunity to get to know their candidates and their priorities. The structure of the forum will be as follows. Candidates will have 30 seconds for introduction statement, one minute to answer three questions each. They will have a 45 second portion to respond to other candidates' answers, and 30 seconds for a closing statement. No questions were given to candidates in advance, and the order of the questions were chosen at random. There is a clock in front of the candidates that will alert them when their time is up. At that point, we ask the candidates to finish their thought, or, we will, uh, or they will be interrupted and we will move on. Now we have Francisco Diaz with the Elections Office for a brief message. Um, I want to thank Benito Link for inviting the Elections Department. And to say that we're fortunate that in San Benito County, we have a news agency like Benito Link that provides factual and responsible news coverage. And also, it warms my heart to have all of you here. Whether you're from a political party, political campaign, or you're like myself, a political enthusiast. And as much as I want, um, as much as I want to make uh, sure you have the accurate information and deadlines, uh, we also rely on people like Benito Link to get and spread out the information out there. But today, I'm going to give you a little bit of election information and deadlines and what's coming up soon. Now, voting kits were delivered to the US Post Office this Saturday. And we're expecting you to receive your voting kit, which is going to include your envelope, your ballot, and also your voter guide no later than this Friday. In San Benito County, you can return your ballot at either by mail or one of our six Dropbox locations. They are conveniently located throughout the county in all four, or four corners of the county. Now, it's important to mention that ballots that are returned in our drop boxes are picked up daily, twice a day, and they have 24-7 video surveillance. But of course, in San Benito County, you also have the option to vote in person. The elections office has been open since Monday and will be all the way up to election day for anybody that chooses to vote in person instead of mail. In addition, we're going to open four voting locations four days before Election Day, and those locations are going to be in San Juan Batista Community Center, St. Benedict's Church, and also at the California Armory over by the Hollister Airport. And finally, I want to encourage everyone to follow us, uh, follow the Elections Office on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, where you can get the most up-to-date information and as a bonus, you get to see a lot of the fun videos that I do and behind the uh, scenes that we do. Uh, there's a lot of good things there. You'll be able to see uh, footage about our ballot processing, signature verification, and of course, election night. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. I'd like to introduce our moderators for this evening. We have Jenny Mendola Arbizu. She has been reporting for Benito Link since 2021. And we have Katie Moore, a Hollister High School student and a former Benito Link intern. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we will begin with the US representative for, 18th, for the 18th Congressional District. Running for U.S. Representative of the 18th District are Supervisor Peter Hernandez and Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. We will begin tonight 
with one minute for uh, 30 seconds for introductions. You will begin with Representative Lofgren. Uh, thank you so very much. First, let me thank um, Benito Link for holding this forum. I remember fondly our forum in the primary. Uh, I uh, am currently the representative of the 19th Congressional District, um, but as the districting commission has changed it to a much bigger district, I've been coming down to San Benito and Monterey uh, very frequently, and thank you so much for war warmly welcoming me, and 30 seconds goes in a hurry. I can see that my time is now up. Thank you, Representative Lofgren. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, you will have 30 seconds. Thank you. My name is Peter Hernandez, and I'm running for Congressional District 18. I'm currently the chair of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. I've shown my passion for local control, representation, and willingness to challenge the burdens placed on my constituents. I've seen the devastation that's come from a large, bloated, wasteful, and meddling government. Miss, is that it? No. Oh. Yeah. Did I hear a no or a yes? No, oh, okay. Sorry. Threw me off. Ms. Lofgren's uh, record has proven to be 100% on board with the Biden agenda that has been disastrous to our nation while getting involved in the daily lives of hardworking Americans. It's time we retire out of control government. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. We will now begin with the first question. About 10,000 residents live in San Benito County, but work in Santa Clara County. In what ways could you improve public transportation and, be and bring tech business here? We will begin with Supervisor Hernandez with one minute. So when it comes to uh, tech business or any kind of industry to come in into uh, our district, basically, we need to open up the economy. We need to strengthen opportunities for jobs. We're dealing with the, the high cost of gas and inflation, right? We're dealing with the negative impacts of the last two years of shutdowns, which has basically eliminated 20,000 businesses in California. If we truly want to be innovative, uh, then we need to give the opportunity for the innovators themselves to be the participants in this process, right? I don't believe government solves problems. It's supposed to facilitate solutions, and that's where I believe the people themselves are the ones that could restore or bring uh, the, the ag and tech businesses into our, into our community. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Lofgren, you will have one minute. Well, first, on transportation, I've heard from all of you that uh, 25 needs to be improved. And in, uh, when I was on the Board of Supervisors in Santa Clara County, I led an effort uh, to build Highway 85 between Cupertino and San Jose and to build Highway 237. I actually know how to do that. And I would like to work with local leaders here to make sure that that gets done. I know it's possible to do. In terms of uh, tech innovation, you know, I've represented Silicon Valley for quite some time. And you need innovation and entrepreneurs, but you also need uh, an environment that allows those entrepreneurs uh, to be successful. Uh, the CHIPS and Science Act, which we, the Congress recently approved, has funding for innovation hubs, which we believe will be very helpful for smaller communities to provide a platform for innovators uh, to be successful, as well as bringing in venture capital. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lofgren. Now for question two. San Benito County represents about a tenth of the district. How will you represent it despite the comparatively low population and fewer votes? We will begin with Representative Lofgren. Well, I, I believe that uh, everybody deserves representation in the Congress. I mean, not only people who vote for me, but people who don't vote for me. And one of the things that I've enjoyed is coming down to San Benito County and getting to know the fabulous people who live here. Um, whether it's San Juan or Hollister, I have two staffers uh, who live in Hollister and I expect to be down here uh, quite a bit. I have been down here uh, very often uh, since the districts were changed and I expect to continue to do this. You know, 
at this stage in my career, I didn't dream that I'd have the opportunity to, to learn and to meet an entirely new group of people and to learn from them. It has been a marvelous experience for me, and I'm grateful to all of you who've taken time to go through what the issues are, to educate me about the things that your community needs. It's really been a delight. So I look forward to doing that. Obviously, tomorrow I have to fly back to Washington uh, for a hearing on Thursday. It's not, I can't be down here every day because I do have a job in Washington, but I know that we will have a great experience together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Lofgren. Uh, for Supervisor Hernandez now. Thank you. So um, representation is literally what I've lived. Like I mentioned, the last two years, that's what I fought for, for the representation for the small business community, uh, for, for the families, and ultimately the children when it came down to the shutdowns, right, making sure that they actually had an opportunity for education and our businesses had an opportunity to be able to thrive as a business, right, and the district in and of itself. But when you look at representation, when it comes to the majority of this district, you have a brand, three brand new counties ultimately to be included into the old district, the old 19, where it's majority rural, it's Latino, it's middle class, it's agricultural. They're very dispersed counties, right? They're separate. There's a small pockets of cities all spread out. I'm, I'm ultimately the one that's, that's ultimately hungrier. Uh, I, I'm younger. I'm obviously ready to fight for this district. I want to make sure that we... Uh, put the energy into unifying that district, strengthening what it means uh, for the Latino voter to understand the outcomes of these decisions, right? I know there's typically a low, low turnout during an election cycle. I am the Congressional District 18. My goal would be to educate the district, to engage the district, teach them ultimately what it means for their voice to count in this, in this civic process, right? Congressional District 18 is exactly what I'm gonna fight for because I am Congressional District 18. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. We will now be moving to our third question. Immigration issues remain unsolved. Why is it so difficult, and what suggestions do you have to solve them? We will begin with Supervisor Hernandez with one minute. So immigration has been an ongoing issue. It hasn't been solved in the last two Democrat administrations. And ultimately what that means is because this has become a political issue every election cycle. The reality is, is we need to fix immigration. But if we really truly care about immigration, we have to strengthen what American citizenship, right? We can't devalue it. We have to make sure that it means something, right? And just the same, we have to also close our borders or at least strengthen the opportunity for our, our communities to basically to preserve the interest of the American population, but obviously fix immigration to where you open up the opportunity for folks like even DACA to be able to stay here, right? We're not going to have that solution with a, with a partisan mindset. We have to make sure that we unify, right? There's, there's a, a 435 House seats across the, across the country. That means we need to bring the majority of those seats to agree on an immigration policy that actually has a long-term benefit and impact to the, to the ultimately to the preservation of the country, but by default to be very much friendly to, to the immigrants that are coming here because they want to enjoy the beauty and the benefits of what it means to be an American. That by default means we preserve the interest of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Representative Lofgren. Uh, immigration has been key to the prosperity and development of our country. Everyone who's here either is an immigrant or is the child or grandchild or great-grandchild. We're all from somewhere else except for the Native Americans. We need to update our immigration laws that are basically uh, are in the same format as they were in 1965. No wonder it's not working that well in 2022. I chair the Immigration Subcommittee, and I've pulled together bipartisan groups uh, to reach consensus on bills in the House, most notably the Farm Workforce Modernization Act that was supported by the United Farm Workers Union and the Western Growers and Farm uh, Bureau. That's in the Senate. Unfortunately, and here's a sad truth, although here in America, Republicans and Democrats agree as voters, the Republicans in the House and Senate have made this a partisan issue. They will not approve uh, reform measures that would clean up a disorderly situation at the border. I believe we can do better.
Thank you, Representative Lofgren. Now each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to any of the points brought up by the other candidate. We will begin with Representative Lofgren. Well, I just would like to say, you know, I, I was listening to Mr. Hernandez about his desire to educate the people of this district. I'd like to put it a different way. I'm, I am appreciating the education I'm getting from the people who live in this district about the issues that face them, the solutions that they are thinking of, and how I might assist. Many of the challenges that you face are not for the federal government to decide. I know there's some local ballot measures. That's for you all to sort out. But for your representatives at, in the federal and state level, the question is how can we get resources to implement uh, the decisions that you make? I've been successful in that my whole life. Uh, I have uh, supported, for example, today, uh, our, with a million dollar allocation to San Jose PD, we can do this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Lofgren. Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, to clarify, the Farm Worker Modernization Act basically creates a new CAW designation, which ultimately it, it creates supposedly a stabilizing of the workforce, but the reality is, is it, it also has taxpayer funded attorneys. It creates a massive liability for the business, um, for, for the farm, Lay, you know, ultimately the farmer, and, uh, and by default, it creates an opportunity for the cost of goods, ultimately the food production, to increase, right? It, by default, prices out the, the small family farms. The reality is, is it's going to authorize class action laws and lawsuits and mandatory damages up to $500,000. At the end of the day, farm workers understand that this is a disaster. Last thing is E-Verify, in and of itself, is going to increase cost also, and it's also... It's definitely not Time. supported by the farmers that I've been talking to and I've been endorsed by the Monterey Farm Bureau. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. We will now be having closing statements. Each candidate will have 30 seconds. We will begin with Supervisor Hernandez. As a proud Latino, I've been endorsed by Luis Arreguin the third candidate in the race, who by the way is a Democrat. Also, many electeds, the Monterey Farm Bureau, the Salinas Chamber of Commerce, Public Safety, like the Narcotic Officers Association and the Santa Clara Police Officers Association. I've seen the breakdown of a top-down mindset with the single party rule in our halls of Congress. From inflation, crime, to out of control spending, and fentanyl leading, the leading cause of death amongst folks between 26 and 44 years old. I was elected to serve Time. in the- I'll just say this, I know that we can bring people together and have a better country. You know, our diversity is our strength, but unity is our power. We did that when we brought growers and farm worker unions together. We can do that in every community. We can stand up to extremism and make sure that our country is true to its constitution and grabs the beautiful free future that we know we all want to enjoy whether it's women's health Time. or anything else. Thank Time. you very much. Thank you. Thank you both candidates very much. Now Jenny Arbizu will come up with this for the State Assembly for the 29th District. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Um, running for the State Assembly, 29th District, our candidate Stephanie L. Castro and Assembly Member Robert Rivas. Uh, so in our early um, toss-up, uh, we decided that we will have for the opening statement um, a candidate, Castro. You can go first for the opening statement. And um, you have, I believe, 30 seconds for that. So you can go ahead and begin. Thank you, Benito Link, for having me, and thank you for everyone uh, being here. My name is Stephanie Castro, and I am running for State Assembly in District 29. I am a wife a mom, a woman of faith, and an educator by passion. I am running for uh, state assembly because I want my constituents' voices to be heard on key issues like more parental involvement in their children's education, as well as fighting inflation so you can keep more money in your pockets at places like the gas pump and grocery stores. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, Assemblymember uh, 
Robert Rivas, you may go ahead and you have 30 seconds to introduce yourself. Well, thank you. In uh, my four years in the State Assembly, um, you know, I'm very proud of the accomplishments um, that we've been able to achieve for our region. You know, I have uh, led the successful passage of legislation in areas such as agriculture, farm worker housing, workplace protections, climate mitigation, and some adaptation in the areas of drought resilience, air quality, and extreme heat. But I look forward to ensuring that we continue our work because certainly we have much work ahead, work to address rising inflation, our local and, and, and regional infrastructure and transportation challenges, our worsening drought, our mental health Thank crisis, you. housing affordability and homelessness, just to name a few areas. But really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for our first question, we're going to um, hand that to Assembly Member Rivas. Um, and you all each have one minute to respond. Uh, how can the assembly help cut back red tape so housing projects can be built more quickly and less expensively? Well, we could certainly help in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, I've been very um, uh, active in this space to reducing red tape, reducing regulation in the housing space, uh, because certainly housing is impacted by affordability. Our, our affordability crisis has many factors. It's a very complex issue. But the fact that there's so many barriers uh, to erecting, um, and, you know, ensuring that we build housing. Um, and a lot of work has been done in this space. Proud to have introduced legislation that was signed by the governor recently uh, to reform the post-entitlement, um, uh, the building process. Once a project is entitled, it gets, goes through CEQA, it goes through all the local levels of review, and then a developer, a builder must pull permits. And in often cases in these larger urban areas, San Francisco, where housing is needed most, there is uh, major delays, sometimes months, years, and so we recently reformed that process to make it easier, quicker, more efficient to build homes and to get those building permits so that way housing can be built and especially our, our, in these urban cores, these job centers that, where we need housing Thank most. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Candidate Castro, how can the assembly help cut back red tape so housing projects can be built more quickly and less expensively? Uh, well, I think in the past it's been a lot easier to build homes. Um, there's been less restrictions. Lately we've had a lot of restrictions that um, unfortunately the builder has to um, accept. And so I think cutting back on the restrictions that we're requiring of builders will help. Um, there's also uh, some um, fees that impact fees that are passed on to the homeowner and the buyer, and uh, I think we can reduce some of those as well. Uh, I think that um, affordable housing is something that we can um, look to um, form, and uh, we can always uh, make sure that uh, houses are um, appropriately built for those who are low income. Um, and we can get them built faster and more efficiently um, depending on the size of the home. Um, but we could just reduce some of the restrictions that we imply on homeowners as well as the builders themselves. Great. Thank you very much. For our second question, uh, again, just to remind you, you have one minute to respond. And uh, candidate Castro, we'll start with you. Students are experiencing mental health issues and are still readjusting from COVID protocols. What can be done to help students recover? Um, I think uh, starting at maybe at the um, elementary level and possibly um, using some of the excess COVID funds that are left over, we can have more counselors available to them at schools. We could start with um, helping their, their um, mental health at schools. Um, so having programs where they are, um, you know, we're supporting their self-esteem, um, helping them to uh, have maybe a kindness program where uh, students are kind to one another and just building each other up instead of tearing each other down sometimes. That tends to happen on the playgrounds and that sort of thing. Um, but just using, I think, the COVID funds that um, could be left over, they could um, use those to, to purchase or to, to fund more counselors and especially start at, at a younger age, um, or even in high school as well. Um, just have more counselors on hand, um, talk to students more, check on them, make sure that they are you know, functioning at a, in a positive way. Thank you, thank you. Assembly Member Rivas, 
students are experiencing mental health issues and are still readjusting from COVID protocols. What can be done to help students recover? Well, I think arguably, you know, we are facing the largest mental health crisis that this state has ever, ever seen. Um, and it's um, our responsibility, and certainly us in the legislature, to lay the groundwork to address it. Um, we must be very, very intentional uh, and open to talking about mental health and pursuing solutions. And we have solutions, uh, a model at our own high school, Samuel High School, where they've opened up a wellness center to support students. We have to think very differently about how we are providing services to students, especially in rural areas, where it's not a level playing field. You know, uh, I had the opportunity to work as a student support manager at Seminary High School. I'm a lifelong resident. The environment at the high school was different than when I was a student there. The way we approach and address and, and provide services to students has to be done differently. It's a different landscape, and we've got to do a better job, and it all starts with resources, ensuring that schools have the resources to provide unique uh, and tailored programs to the needs of the student body. Thank you. Okay, um, and then we'll go ahead and with our third question. Assembly Member Rivas, you can start with this again. Uh, farmers say agencies have contradictory laws. What can be done to simplify agricultural agencies and regulations within the state? That's a great question. I've worked very closely with many of these regulatory agencies as chair of agriculture. I've had the opportunity to uh, chair agriculture um, uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, and so we have worked very closely with all these agencies. The secretary, we're very lucky as a state to have Karen Ross as the secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. We've been working closely with her uh, to create this kind of one-stop shop center. Uh, a lot of our farmers, uh, big or small, the ones that struggle the most are our small farmers, medium-sized farmers, family farmers. They don't have the high-priced consultants, the legal uh, um, uh, team to navigate the bureaucracy that they face in applying for funding, in, 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 in trying to understand regulatory um, uh, rules. Uh, and, and so what we've done is, rather than have these, 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 these agricultural entities go from agency to agency, we want to create a one-stop shop where they're going and, 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 and uh, have one application, meet with one representative, so that way all the information is streamlined and it's efficient for them and made very easy Thank moving you. forward. Thank you. Candidate Castro, farmers say agencies have contradictory laws. What can be done to simplify agricultural agencies and regulations within the state? Uh, well, I believe that um, we can help our farmers by um, just not um, having so many regulations on them. Um, although I'm not a politician, um, I would definitely reach across the aisle um, and rely on my staff to uh, coordinate with other state agencies. Um, I am, you know, it's a learning curve, so I would be learning from farmers and learning what they want and, and listening to them and hearing them out. Um, but, you know, I definitely know that water is an issue and we need to make sure that we can create some water um, retention facilities or um, areas where they can, um, you know, have use of water and that they won't be so overregulated and um, you know, burdened with not being able to grow for our families. Um, we need that water to flow so that we can provide for our families and we can um, you know, not see our prices raised in the grocery stores either. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to any of the points brought up by the other candidate. Uh, candidate Castro. Uh, you can go ahead and go ahead and respond. Well, um, as I said, I am not a politician. I'm grassroots from the ground up. Um, so I'm not, you know, polished in, you know, my, uh, you know, my knowledge. But um, I, again, I will reach across the aisle to um, other representatives and uh, lawmakers in order to get things done. I want to make a positive um, impact on my community, and I want to make sure that things are done. Um, that maybe weren't done such so well um, lately. And uh, so I just really want to reach across the aisle and be the person to um, help my community and, and help everyone um, feel you know, like they, ma they matter and that they're not living paycheck to paycheck like I hear a lot of my um, constituents Thank are doing. You. So 
I just want, just want to be a positive um, Thank voice you. for them. Thank you. Appreciate it. Us, Assemblymember Rivas, you may go ahead and uh, respond to any um, points brought up by the other candidate. I don't uh, have any response to any points. That we okay. Have. Okay. Now each candidate will have 30 seconds for a closing statement. We'll go ahead and start with um, Assemblymember Rivas. Well, I'm a uh, lifelong resident of San Diego County. I'm the grandchild of a farm worker who came here in the early 60s to build a better life. Uh, as a former member of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors and, and now as your representative in the California State Assembly, it's been an honor to represent uh, the community that has given me and my family so much. Uh, this is my home. My wife and I are raising our daughter here, and I remain committed to making a positive difference for the communities I represent, to making a positive difference for San Benito County, uh, to do all I can to make our region, to make our state a Thank better you. place for all people, and ensuring that the doors of opportunity remain open for the next generation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Candidate Castro, you have 30 seconds for a closing statement. Thank you uh, once again to Medina Link for having me this evening and for the opportunity to address key issues facing our communities. I want to be the one fighting in Sacramento, listening to my constituents and solving these problems and more. I look forward to collaborating with fellow lawmakers and using the expertise of my constituency to learn from. I want to create a positive change using common sense values to do better than what's been done before. I will fight for parental rights and ed education, focus on creating water storage, and will fight inflation in this down economy. My name is Stephanie Castro, and I'm state, running for State Assembly, District 29, and I appreciate you. your support in November. Thank you. Now, Katie will come up for uh, San Benito County Board of Supervisors, District 1. All right, good evening. Running for San Benito County Board of Supervisor District 1, our current supervisor, Betsy Dirks, and candidate Dom Zanger. We will begin with 30 seconds of an opening statement, beginning with candidate Zanger. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Dom Zanger. I was raised here in San Benito County. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara, got a communications degree, and eventually I came back to San Benito and I noticed all the changes that had taken place and are still taking place. And so I felt compelled to get involved and steer those changes in a better direction. Specifically, I'm talking about the irresponsible residential growth. I truly care about this county and that's why I'm the only candidate in this race that isn't taking money from developers or other special interest groups. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zenger. Supervisor Betsy Dirk. My name is Betsy Dirks, and I was appointed by the governor in October of 2021. I grew up in neighboring Monterey County, and my husband and I have been living in San Benito County for 20 years, where, where we are raising our two kids, a 15-year-old daughter who attends Hollister High School, and my son, who is 12, and he attends Spring Grove in North County. I'm rooted in this community through experience, extensive experience in leadership, in working in nonprofits here. I've been working hard to preserve and cultivate, cultivate the timeless traditions of San Benito County. I believe it is time for real leadership. Is that, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you candidates. Moving on to our first question. The county's 2022-23 budget is $234 million. What experience do you have that prepares you for handling this kind of financial responsibility? We will begin with Supervisor Dirks. Thank you. Is it? Okay, thank you. Um, I actually in April and starting in April, we did the budget for this coming fiscal year for San Benito County. So I have firsthand experience in doing this. Um, we just did it. We needed to be able to look specifically at all of the employment um, opportunities that are available in the county. Different departments always want to add staff and personnel, which we need in order to better serve our community. And so doing that, in addition to looking ahead at a potential recession that we have coming and making sure that we're responsible in the decisions that we're making. Also, too, we prioritized money for the roads as well, since we know that is a number one issue in this county. So we're addressing needs that are affecting the everyday lives of our residents. In addition to this, 
Um, I have run my own business for the last 18 years where I've dealt with over 40 budgets and making sure that everybody um, stays profitable and that they're doing what they need to do for their business. Thank you. Thank you, Can uh, Supervisor Dirks. Candidate Zenger. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's very clear that the county has been fiscally responsible with the budget. Uh, that's evident in the condition of the roads, among other issues. And what we need is leadership that can allocate funds more appropriately because that hasn't been being done. I have a degree from UC Santa Barbara. I worked in uh, estate management and multi-million dollar properties and I excelled at that. So what we need to do is really allocate funds where they ought to be allocated correctly. Because right now, the way we've been doing things, the way we've been building out, it's not working for the county and it's not serving us. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zinger. Now we have question three. We have distribution centers that offer lower paying entry level wages. What will you do to bring higher paying skilled jobs to the county? We will begin with candidate Zenger. Thank you, yeah. Um, so what our county should do is lean into the spaces that we already excel at. I'm talking about ag, wine industry, tourism, and then build on those areas. Salinas does a lot of innovation in ag with autonomous tractors and things like that. That's spaces that we should be leaning into. We can get those high skill jobs that still work within our county culture, within the community, and that's really the direction we ought to be going. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zenger. <laughs> Supervisor Dirks. We do need jobs that offer career opportunities and we will not get that if Measure Q passes. We need economic growth in this county, and in order to do that, we need to have the ability for businesses to come here and start a new generation of where we need to go and diversify our revenue. If we don't have the ability to do this, then we are going to be staying in the same place where we are, and we will continue to face the same issues and challenges with our roads and with traffic that we currently have. We have 11,000 people leaving the county on a daily basis for jobs. We need the opportunity to create jobs here in this county, and we will not be able to do that if Measure Q passes. Thank you, Supervisor Dirks, for question three. What is your opinion on the designated county nodes? How do you weigh their potential revenue against the possibility of changing the character of the county? We will begin with Supervisor Dirks. So the way we grow really matters. And that is why we need people in position to look at these issues directly and thoroughly to make sure that we're making those choices. Again, this circles back around to Measure Q. If you take away the ability for supervisors to help make those choices specifically with these designated county nodes, then we're going to run into issues where we possibly will have growth that doesn't really make sense. This is bad public policy and we need to make sure that those of you who are electing officials, that not only you have faith in those officials, but those officials have faith in themselves. I have faith that if elected, I will be able to help make those decisions so that our county can grow in a way that preserves our traditions, but also cultivates prosper prosperity for all of our county residents and for businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Dirks. Responding candidate Zeng. Thank you. Um, so I think it's obvious that these should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, and it should be left up to a mix of the supervisors and community input as to what we should do about this. Uh, my opponent, it's, she was opposed to the nodes of Measure K two years ago, and now she fervently champagns those things. So there's obviously something else at play here. The nodes, most of them right now that were pre-planned need to be reevaluated in my opinion. I think it needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's the best way to move going forward. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zenger. We will now be moving on to candidate response time. Each candidate will have 45 seconds to create a response if they so choose. We will begin with candidate Zenger. Yeah, so um, I'll just respond to some of the, uh, the Q stuff out there that's going around. Um, look, Measure Q is about land use change being decided by the voters instead of the Board of Supervisors. It's giving the community a say in how the county grows versus not. 
My opponent has made it clear she does not think the community should have a say in how the county grows. I oppose that. I think that's false. I think the community should absolutely have a say in it. And that's evident based on the way we've been growing the last several years. It's been disastrous for the county. It's evident in the roads, in the traffic, the infrastructure problems. And beyond that, my opponent, does that mean 10 seconds? What does that mean? I will right, leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zenger. Can Supervisor Dirks. Thank you. So I believe it all starts with education. And if you do your homework and you, there, my opponent has talked about irresponsible growth. He's talked about being fiscally irresponsible. But if you look at the history of these issues, then you would understand exactly why we are where we are today. And it doesn't have anything to do with irresponsibility. It has to do with how we have been given what we've been given and what we are doing with it. And that's what really matters. Because at the end of the day, we only get 11 cents on the dollar for our property taxes. And this is really the reason why Measure Q is so important, because we have to diversify as a county. If we don't diversify our money, we're going to be in trouble. And so all right now, all of our money is in the property tax basket. And we need to make sure that we have sales tax in this county to help this Thank county you. continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Dirks. We will now be moving on to closing statements. Each candidate will have 30 seconds to create a closing statement. We will begin with Supervisor Dirks. As a woman and a working mother of two, I will always make the choice that is best for San Benito County, not just for today, but for tomorrow too. The choices I make are for people, for the residents of District 1, for you, for your family, and for my family. I will every single time I will make that choice, and I have proven this over and over. And this is why I've been endorsed by everyone across our community, different organizations, and most recently I'm honored to be endorsed by Kim Hawk, who was a candidate for District 1 in the primary. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Dirks. Candidate Zenger. Thank you. Endorsed by everyone in the community is a, a bold claim, but Anyway, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. This has been fun. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. With me, what you see is what you get. Uh, that's why I've made up my mission to be as clear and forthright as possible. And that's why I try not to dance around issues or change my tune when push comes to shove because I don't need to because my positions are good for this county and the people of this county know that and that's why they support them. I have a tangible and realistic path forward. We need to take these steps so that we can get the county back on track. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zenger. Thank you. Now with Jenny with the next race. Okay, running for San Juan Batista City Council are candidate Edwin Sabathia, uh, candidate uh, Jackie Morris Lopez, candidate Jose Aranda, council member Leslie Jordan, and candidate Steve Harris. And, and am I pronouncing your name, Edwin? Sabathia, am I pronouncing that correct? Okay. Uh, candidates um, Morris Lopez, Aranda, Council Member Jordan, and candidate Harris are not in attendance tonight. So it's just going to be a you and me game. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we will begin with your introduction. You have 30 seconds to introduce yourself, please. I'll do a real good job of just arguing with myself up here. <laughs> so my name is Edwin or EJ Savathia. I am a resident of San Juan Batista, have been since early 2018. Um, I'm originally from Evergreen, California. I say Evergreen, not San Jose, because Evergreen was a really small community that I grew up in, and I, I really appreciated that that small community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, we're going to go ahead and start with our, our first question. And you have one minute to respond. OK. San Juan. <laughs> I think I should get five. <laughs> well, actually, we're kind of behind, so this kind of helps us. Um, San Juan Batista, as a tourist town, was damaged by COVID closures. How could the town be more economically diverse? So one of my, my 
guiding principles, guiding thoughts and desires for San Juan is economic development, and I think that's how we get economically diverse. We have a lot of great businesses, um, but there's a lot of great businesses that a lot of other small towns have and things are doing well that, that we aren't right now. Um, and so spending some time to get some of those businesses, um, there's no pharmacy in town, um, you know, there's not a lot, there's a lot of great restaurants, there is no fine dining. Um, we have some slow EV chargers, but just more things to get more foot traffic in town and highlight and get people to realize all the great things about San Juan. Okay, great, thank you. Um, what are the, the three top issues facing San Juan Batista and how do you propose addressing them? Water, water, and wastewater. Um, <laughs> so right now, a big issue is the, the quality of the water coming in and the quality of water going out from San Juan. There's been a lot of work being done to kind of get a framework and a plan for things that, are, that should be happening in the future to, to fix that. The big problem, we don't have a way to pay for it. It's a $12 million project. We have $4 million in funding. The remainder of that $8 million is going to be footed by the, the citizens of San Juan. And it's a community of you know, less than 3,000 people. So it's a lot of financial burden for one community to, to bear. Okay, and what ideas do you have that could help San Juan Batista and Hollister work better together for the benefit of the whole county? Well, there's a lot going on. I mentioned the water and I mentioned economic development. There's already a project going on. There's the framework for San Juan's water and wastewater, um, you know, the wastewater to be sent to Hollister and then some of the, the, the water coming in to be diversified and, and piggybacking on some of the, the systems that Hollister has. Um, Anything I can do to, to streamline and or expedite that, that process, I think I would be really good. Thank you. Now, normally we would let you uh, respond for 45 seconds, but I think we'll go ahead and skip that. And just to be fair, unfortunately, and just to be fair, um, we will give you 30 seconds for a closing statement. <laughs> I don't think you have anybody to respond to. But <laughs> But 30 seconds, okay. go ahead for your so closing statement. So I mentioned San Juan being a small town. Um, even though San Benito is a small county, we're, we're a relatively small fraction of that. Uh, I don't think that diminishes the, the quality and or, or worth of our, our voice uh, within the county. Um, I know that the, it, it isn't that the, the county isn't concerned about what's going on in San Juan, but I think that concern and some of that messaging is being lost between county leadership and the citizens of San Juan. So I'd like to see that that communication line cleared. Great, thank you. We really appreciate you, candidate Sabathia. <laughs> okay, now Katie will come up for Hollister City Council District 2. All right, good evening. Uh, tonight we have running for Hollister City Council District 2. Um, Council Member Roland Rizendez, Candidate Celeste Toledo Bocanegra, and Candidate Hani Mezuni. We will begin with 30 second opening statements, starting with uh, Candidate Bocanegra. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. My name is Celeste Toledo Bocanegra. I am here today because I have decided to run for City Council District 2 to help represent my district, who is the hardworking class citizen and who are underrepresented. I have also noticed these past two years our local patriots being underrepresented. And I'm here to bring that representation to all. Our local government needs checks and balances from Thank the school you. district, city, and board of supervisors. Thank you. I will be that representation. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Bocanegra. We will now move on to uh, Council Member Resendez. Thank you, Benito Link. Thank you, everyone, for being here in attendance and everyone watching at home. My name is Roland Resendez. I'm the current city councilman for District 2 in Hollister, California. I'm a teacher. I work for the Hollister School District, and it has been an extreme honor to represent you for the last four years. Some of the things that I've accomplished are to update our general plan, update our county city tax sharing agreement, raise an LGBTQ plus flag for the first time in our city's history, and serve the people of Hollister during a worldwide pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Resendez. Candidate Mezuni. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. My name is Hany Mezuni. I'm running for District 2. Uh, very much, uh, basically, I'm 
I'm running because uh, this is my home and this is my family's home. I have four children, three girls and one son. And um, I have been in the technology field for over 30 years. I'm certified project manager and certified, and, and I'm just gonna, uh, just basically saying that I walk the talk. So I'm just gonna really bring in my uh, experience to all of this, thank you. Thank you, candidate Mizuni. We'll now be moving on to our first question. We have had several gang-related shootings over the last couple of years. Hollister Police Department says it is understaffed. What can be done to make Hollister safer? We will begin with candidate, or uh, Council Member Resendez. Thank you. So um, I believe that our police officers need to be fairly compensated. It's no secret that some officers are leaving to work in different cities and different counties because they can earn much more money. Here in the city of Hollister, since I've been your elected official, we have given incentives to for police officers when they get hired on. We've given incentives for financial reasons for people who want to continue on their education. We have a police chief of police who now not only prioritizes our safety, but he has great communication with our city and all of the residents. Our police need to know that we support them 100%. We need to compensate them fairly. We've done so during my time on the city council, and I plan on continuing that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Resendez. Um, we will now be moving on to um, Sorry, uh, Candidate Mizuni. Sure, uh, so I worked for the sheriff, uh, Cook County in Illinois. I also worked for the probation department right here. So you would say that I do have hands-on experience with that kind of, you know, with law enforcement. So I agree that we really need to, you know, look at salaries, look at benefits, really trying to attract the best out of the best out there. We also need to do some research. We also need to do some studying. We also do some, you know, we are responsible to make sure that we have the right people for the right position. We have the right people for, you know, with the, uh, with the same averages out there. You cannot attract people over here if you're gonna pay less than what the other counties are paying. So you have to really attract the right people to come here, but also we need to do plenty of training and plenty of supporting to the police department. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Mizuni. Now moving on to candidate Bocanegra. So in 2006, I graduated from the police academy and I went through a vigorous training and I saw firsthand what it meant to be a police officer. And unfortunately, during the past two years, there were groups in our community and also throughout the state that wanted to defund the police. Unfortunately, that has trickled down to the city level where we cannot have, or people don't want to apply. So how can we get these um, younger youths wanting to apply for law enforcement? I think we, it's just a culture change. We just need to stop um, going down that narrative that we need to defund the police and stop criminalizing our police officers when they're actually there to help us and save us. Um, and I have done some research, and we are at pay, a good pay rate for a law enforcement officer here in our community. Uh, yes, it could be more, but we need to stop criminalizing our police officers and focus on that so our society gets a better, clear message that we are here to back them up, because I'm here to back up the blue. Thank you, candidate Bocanegra. Now, for our second question. Why has the city lost so many experienced quality staff members? How will you keep them and avoid the high turnover? We will begin with candidate Mizuni. Sure, this has been uh, a very interesting subject and very hard one to really deal with for the last 20 years uh, or so. Um, my, there's a lot of different, uh, what do you call, practical solutions. So w one is probably salaries, one is, another one is benefits, but also you have to find the environment. You have to find uh, the right training and the good training. You also have to find the support. All these things really combine together you know, as a package for the, uh, for the staff. So if the staff feels that they're comfortable where they're working based on their salary, based on their innovation, based on their uh, creativity, and based on their support from the, staff, from the rest of the organization, you'll have staff come around. I've been in the business for over 30 years. I worked for uh, government and I also worked for private sector. I know how to keep the staff around. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Mizuni. We now are moving on to candidate Bocanegra. 
Okay, so um, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Why has the city lost so many experienced quality staff members? How will you keep them and avoid the high turnover? I think um, being exp um, working in probation or having just a general uh, community position in our local uh, community, I've noticed that um, no one just wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to be a great manager. Um, I think the training involved in um, understanding that the managers are here to help uh, our community members um, in every aspect, probation, um, just uh, public health, um, just understanding that people have regular lives uh, of family and struggles. Um, and with our economy these days, everyone is struggling. Not There's not one person here not struggling. So um, just understanding, uh, hu just being that regular human and individual and um, taking that extra step to, ha to have that perfect training. Thank you, Canada Bocanegra. We will now have Council Member Resendez. Thank you. It's no secret that the city and the county are known for having basically been a training ground for people to leave us and go work in the Bay Area to earn much more money. Many of the citizens already commute to go to the Bay Area. The reason is they cannot afford to live here comfortably. They cannot afford to provide for their families. They cannot afford to buy a home. This goes back to the irresponsible way that we've been developing for years. I do think that we need to support yes on measure Q, allow the people a chance to decide on how we grow in the future so that teachers like myself, nurses, and everybody else like our police officers can afford to live here and not leave us to go live somewhere else. Hollister's a beautiful city and our county is a beautiful county. But if we keep making the same mistakes of the past and we keep developing as we have in the past with the Board of Supervisors being controlled by special interests, then that's what we're gonna have in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Resendez. We will now have question three. Governor Newsom has announced that he intends to build millions of homes over the next 10 years. Cities will be fined for not complying. What are your ideas to provide affordable housing in Hollister? We will begin with candidate Bocanegra. This is very um, true to me because in District 2, we have a lower class income, and this is a must. I will do everything in my effort to push back um, within our city and work and collaborate with other cities and see how we can push back against these mandates, at least uh, focus on making sure that if, the, if Governor Newsom wants to bring housing, then we hey, you know what? These are our grounds. You want to bring housing? You need to fix our infrastructure. Um, on the west side, we're having a ton of older uh, grandfather uh, 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 streets that need to be repaved. And um, so I can start naming them out, Circle Verde, Rancho, uh, Ranchito Court. So all these older grandparent streets need to be repaved. And under this administration now, um, has nothing that hasn't been happening. All we've gotten are bumps and ro uh, the roundabouts. And that's not gonna work. I'm sorry, we need better system. Thank you, candidate Bocanegra. Now we will have Councilmember Resendez. Thank you. Again, it goes back to being factual with our information and not spreading lies and mistruths here. It is not true. It is not true that we have to build within our county. We're actually exempt from building within our county because we're considered rural agricultural land. We have a problem with special interest developers paying funds to candidates during campaign time, and then they in turn vote in favor for their projects. We need to vote yes on Measure Q, and yes, we do need more local control. We have to look at very creative ways in order to start building higher density, more affordable housings, and let's be honest, the fact of the matter is that we're completely out of balance and we've approved way too many single family homes for previous city councils, not during mine. When I was first here, it was me and one other person who were voting against the development, and for the last couple of years, we do have like-minded individuals voting to slow down the growth, and I'm very grateful for that. If we want to continue that, Time. then we need citizens that are gonna stand up, and we need council members that are gonna stand Thank up you. to slow the development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Resendez. Uh, 
candidate Mizuni. Yeah, so I, again, experience counts. Um, I have worked for a neighborhood housing services in Chicago, and there's plenty of different solutions that we can come up with. Really, I mean, we have to go you know, out to the federal, we have to go to the state, we have to go to the other counties to help out and fund us and get some grants and look at, you know, and apply for some grants and also look at um, nonprofit uh, loans. There's plenty of that, of that stuff out there. I mean, I'm not really sure why we're not looking at that already. Uh, so that's, again, um, it's really experience counts. I mean, you have to talk to somebody that knows this stuff. I have been through this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Mizuni. We will now have 45 second candidate response section. We will be beginning with council member Resendez. Thank you. Um, none of the council members that I know of during my tenure have ever spoken about defunding the police. In fact, it's been the complete opposite. We need to fund the police and we need to fund them and compensate them well. Um, another thing is that since I'm, I've been your councilman, $30 million have been allocated to repave all of the city streets, the sidewalks, and the alleys. So again, it comes down to having factual information, not believing in extreme political views, or conspiracy theories. I've spoken to residents like my opponent that just moved here from San Jose and they're all saying the same thing. Too much traffic on 25, too much growth, and they want to see it slow down. If you want to talk about how many grants we've had, then let's look at how many grants and spread factual information because we've got tons of grants and millions of dollars coming to the city. So the Thank information you. you're hearing is just not true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Resendez. We will now have candidate Mizuni. Um, so, uh, is this uh, response time? Response time. So, there's two things that I really want to respond to. Well, actually, mostly the questions. One is that economy uh, or economic 101. If you're not going to grow, how are you going to have houses for the people that want to bring in for jobs? I, that doesn't make sense. If you know, you have to grow. You have to provide affordable houses so people can come here and get a job and work and grow. You know and uh, raise their family, that's one issue. The other issue I'm, I'm, I'm having how, uh, a problem with is if you're saying that grants are, are, are over there, I don't see any uh, actual factual work that has been done. So if you have all the money, wh where's, the, uh, uh, where's the actual roads that have been fixed? Where's the actual uh, sewage that have been fixed? Where's the actual pipes that have been fixed? Thank you. Thank you, candidate Mizuni. We will now have candidate Bocanegra with a response. Well, the truth is that the mayor is basically dominates every facet of the city and Roland, you're just his puppet. And that's obvious to everyone. So I have been endorsed by several community uh, businesses, one being Paramount Communications, uh, Kamal Yoga Studio, Fusion Kids Center, Hollister Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Ohana Shaved Eyes, Civilian Defense Group, Vedana Freitas from Remax Gold, Chris Costa, who's with the Armed Women of America, and John F. Clower, who is a former businessman and law enforcement officer, and One Source Integration. And I just want to thank everyone for um, helping with my campaign, don uh, the donors and volunteers. And I'm very humbled being here today. I really appreciate you. And I'm, I hope um, I would be a, a thought in your thank vote. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, candidate Bocanegra. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we will now be moving on to closing statements. Um, right? Yeah, sorry. We will now be moving on to closing statements. I'm so sorry. 30 seconds for each candidate. We will begin with candidate Mezuni. Sure. So again, I'm, I'm just going to walk the talk. Um, I have a master's degree in engineering. I have a master's degree in business. I really led many uh, companies. I've led many departments. I've led many teams. I worked in the technology industry for over 30 years. I worked for the private sector. I also worked for the government sector. I'm bringing in experience. I'm bringing in actual solutions. I'm bringing in, uh, I'm also a certified project manager. This is my home. I want to make sure it stays my home and stays a great place to live in. Thank you, candidate Mizuni. Candidate Bocanegra. You know, I don't have any experience being a politician. I am, however, a mom a wife, 
and a community member, very active to my community. Whether it be right or left, I believe in the First Amendment, and I have united myself with um, Mia Casey and Elia Salinas and other um, op opposing uh, members of our community to uh, basically um, fight for our First Amendment right. Um, so no matter where you stand in the aspect of whatever your Thank belief you. system is, I will be here to represent everyone. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Bocanegra. Mm -hmm. Finally, with closing statement, we have Council Member Resendez. Thank you. Again, during my time as your councilman, I have helped to update our general plan, reform campaign finance reform, code of ethics, start an arts and culture commission, um, also do the outdoor park, outdoor downtown park that's what has generated over $10 million in the last year alone, okay? Um, if you wanna talk about being a public servant, I'm gonna let you know it's a very thankless job. But I certainly can attest to being coming. A council member does not come without its challenges as you can see here tonight. It has been a great honor and I'm extremely humbled to represent the, rep, the citizens of Thank District you. 2 and I look forward to continuing to representing them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Resendez. And thank you for all of our candidates from Hollister City Council District 2. Running for Hollister City Council District 3, our Council Member Dolores uh, Morales and candidate Rosalinda Sanchez. Okay, we will begin with introductions. Um, candidate Sanchez, we'll go ahead with you and you have 30 seconds to introduce yourself. I'm Rosalinda Sanchez, and like many, I chose uh, Hollister because of its natural beauty and small town vibe. When I moved here, I worked in arts education, holding a degree in business and management. My passion for empowering students through arts education led me to working with local families here in Hollister on a grassroots level, helping them become more engaged in their students' academic lives. I partnered to open an arts academy here in Hollister as an arts education, uh, as arts education uh, has shown to create enthusiasm around academics. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, time is up. Thank you. Um, Council Member uh, Morales, 30 seconds to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dolores Morales. I'm the, currently the council member representing District 3. Very honored to have the privilege of doing so. I'm a mother of two a beautiful young men I, am, uh, I work as a program manager where I have the privilege of overseeing $40 million budget for the juvenile division, where I oversee legislation implementation, program development, evaluation, and our communication strategy for effectiveness. Um, I'm running, or I ran, because I want to improve the quality of life of our residents. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What's up? It's good. Okay, um, now each candidate will receive the same question. You, have, um, you each have one minute to respond. Um, Council Member Morales. Uh, there has been discussion over changing Hollister from a general law city to a charter city. Which would be best for Hollister and why? I know that's not there, but. <laughs> but why? Um, well, you know, we are, the city of Hollister is part of um, San Benito County and the state of California, and of course the United States. I think when we detach ourselves um, and become a, a general law, then we miss out on the opportunity of funding. And so when you have um, limited resources, just as the city of Hollister does, it is not to our best interest to do so. Well, I know that there's a lot of things that are coming down that we may not agree with, I think this is an opportunity to work collaboratively with our partners um, at the state level to make sure that uh, we, we have mutual needs um, and understanding of what that might look like together. Thank you, thank you. Um, candidate Sanchez, there has been discussion over changing Hollister from general law city to a charter city. Which would be best for Hollister? So I am going to have to pass on this question. I'm not going to pretend that I know. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to answer that question, but that is not one that I prepared for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next question, um, candidate Sanchez, uh, what issues specific to the neighborhoods in your district are you planning to address if elected? 
Well, one of the biggest uh, ones that kept coming up uh, as I walked um, the neighborhoods, um, specifically in the area where I live, uh, was uh, basically the unhoused situation. Um, and I see this every day uh, as a small business owner uh, in uh, the downtown area, as well as living in that area, and find that we definitely need more solutions around mental health. Of course, the housing crisis plays a huge role into that because people become unhoused uh, because of the fact that they cannot afford it. The, what the jobs are paying does not basically match um, what um, you know the home prices are and rentals. So there's uh, a lot of solutions that um, we need to look at in terms of mental health and programming. I'm about going to the root of the problem, which means we start with programming and our work our way up. I don't believe that we band-aid things. We need to come up with real solutions that are Thank sustainable. You. Thank you. Um, Council Member Morales, what issues specific to the neighborhoods in your district are you planning to address if elected? Well, the issues um, in the 11 months that I've been in office have been safety um, issues with uh, people that are speeding through our neighborhoods and, of course, road conditions. So we've been working diligently to um, do sections and uh, city areas so that it's more cost-effective. Um, safety can be addressed in a variety of different ways with either law enforcement or just looking um, and setting the areas to see whether a stop sign or even um, strategies like they have in Willow Glen where they have flags to be able to cross the street effectively with lights so that there's uh, more of a warning as they're walking. Um, the other issue that our residents have shared is, of course, homelessness. So I'll, I'll share a, a strategy. And then also the fact that um, especially people who don't have to commute, they feel trapped um, between 11 to 1 where they don't want to leave to go to Costco or to go to anywhere else because of how long it takes to come back and, and forth to our city. But for homelessness, um, you know, we're looking at three strategies, uh, and that's to address the root causes. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> okay. Our next question. Um, Council Member Morales. Can you control your Okay. Council Member Morales. Uh, what effect do you think the Hollister Farms big box stores will have on downtown businesses? Did you say big bot? Big box. Oh, big box. <laughs> stores, like Target. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, oh, sorry, I didn't Which, understand the question. Okay, okay, so yes, got it, got it now. So um, there needs to be a balanced approach. So while I think many of us appreciate, and, and I even noticed on social media that people were really excited about TJ Maxx and Ross, Chipola coming in, um, you know, Target has been here. We, our residents need to have local options so that they're not commuting to Gilroy or Salinas to, to buy some of the things at Costco and um, Home Depot are, are one of them. So if, they're not, if there's an opportunity for them to be built here, great. I know that there's, um, numbers in terms of whether it's appropriate for them to be built here or not. I think um, Hollister is very proud to support small businesses and to support community, and, and we do so effectively, I believe. So always a balanced approach. Thank you. Thank you. All right, okay. All right candidate Sanchez, what effect do you think the Hollister Farms big box stores will have on downtown businesses? Essentially, they come with lower wages. So lower wages means that they would not be able to afford the high rents and the high mortgages that are in the area. Uh, so it's definitely important that we also recognize that we have we need more high quality careers within the city limits of Hollister. This is the way that people are going to afford to stay here, uh, live here, sustain a living here. Otherwise. Um, as we see, gentrification has definitely been happening. It continues to happen. People are continuing to be booted out to different uh, cities, and I'm a product of that as well, meaning coming into a different town uh, that now I've been here for several years, but because we were priced out from where we lived. And the same thing is happening here. Uh, people are now having to go to places like Los Banos. So we definitely need more high-quality careers uh, and not the big box uh, stores that pay less. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now each candidate 
We'll have 45 seconds to respond to any of the points brought up by the other candidate. Uh, candidate Sanchez, you can go ahead and begin. I'm actually all good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Council Member Morales. I'm just going to finish my thought on homelessness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so addressing the root cause of homelessness through system and policy change, expand homelessness prevention and housing programs to meet the need, and then improve quality of life for unsheltered individuals and create healthy neighborhoods for all. Three strategies are very simple, but implemented effectively in a variety of different jurisdictions. Um, I think anything can be solved again with communication, collaboration, and just being able to work at a goal and be able to measure it. Thank you. Thank you. Now each candidate will have 30 seconds for a closing statement. Uh, Council Member Morales. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for, you, um, for me to speak here today. Uh, one of some of my accomplishments in the 10, 11 months I've been in office was to add a city manager, assistant city manager to act as a public information officer so that there's more communication with our residents. Uh, did contract for grant management. Uh, also our city manager is responsible for training and to help the overall city needs. We um, also added uh, several analyst positions to be able to identify tr uh, trends to help our police department look at crime effectively, look at funding, and then being able to prevent effective preventative measures for Thank community you. safety. Thank you. <laughs> Candidate Sanchez. So when I decided to um, take this journey of running for office, I recall uh, going to City Hall and getting caught in a situation where uh, there was a cat and mouse of these uh, three young men. Uh, two of them were running after uh, one of them, and I was fearful for the kid because I realized they were running after him. I was caught in the middle of that and realized that um, as a person who works with youth, um, and since they are our future, we need to focus on them. This is why I ran, because I work with youth. I have solutions to be able to make sure that these sort of um, situations Thank not you. just become less, but where we um, interest them more in education and a future of running Hollister in Thank the future. Thank you, Candidate Sanchez. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, now Katie will come up for the mayor for City of Hollister. All right, good evening. Um, welcome to the Hollister mayoral race. Uh, running for mayor of Hollister this uh, election is Mayor Ignacio Velasquez and candidate Mia Casey. We will begin with 30 seconds for opening statements, starting with current Mayor Velasquez. Thank you very much, and thank you for putting on this forum. I'm Ignacio Velasquez, proud, proud mayor of the city of Hollister. I want to tell you a few things that have happened over my time as city mayor. Before I became mayor, the city was near bankruptcy. Today, we have paid off over $60 million in debt. We are now investing in our infrastructure, over $30 million to fix our roads, our sewer lines, our water lines, a lot of good things. Over 500 new jobs have come to our community. Over 100 Thank million you. additional retail dollars have come in in the last few years alone. So we're very excited about what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Velasquez. Candidate Casey. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mia Casey. I am running for mayor to improve the quality of life here. I have 35 years of experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. You know, I've heard from so many residents who feel they're no longer being listened to or cared about when it comes to local leaders. We can and must do better to respond to community concerns. I know I can bring the unity and leadership we need to move us in a more positive direction. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Casey. We will now move on to question one. There has been a 26 per 26% increase in San Benito County homelessness between 2019 and 2022. What are the core causes that need to be addressed to reduce homelessness in Hollister? How will you address them? We will have one minute for this question and we will start with candidate Casey. Mm. Well, that was an easy question. Um, <laughs> so uh, much of what happened over the last few years, I, I think is directly related to the pandemic. We've always had um, the unhoused, but we saw great uh, rises um, over the past few years. I know that the county and the city have been looking at uh, inter, 
I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping a word here, transitional housing as well as permanent housing. But there's more to it than that. You have to start looking at the, the mental health issues. It's a whole um, ball of wax that you have to look at, and I think it's going to take uh, the county and city working hard together to try to deal with that issue and try to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Casey. <laughs> Mayor Velasquez. Well, I'm proud to say I was actually part of the group that brought a full-time, 24-hour, seven-day-a-week homeless shelter to our community, working with the county and city together. We made great strides, but one of the early mistakes that was made there was not enough beds. We started with 50. I did recommend 100. Now we do see an increase. You're seeing this across the, uh, the state. We need the resources here, but we need to provide the shelter first. County and city are actually working on this right now to make that happen. So I have to say thank you to the county supervisors for the work they're doing with the city to accomplish that goal. And we're going to see a change here. And, uh, we're, you know, I, I had somebody come visit recently that said to me, wow, what are you guys doing here? You guys are really handling this problem well. And it's a partnership we have with Monterey Bay County, too. They, with us have really made a change in the state locally. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Velasquez. We will now be moving on to question two. What is the difference between a charter city and a general law city, and which would be best for Hollister? We will begin with Mayor Velasquez. There's, there's a big difference. I heard this question earlier. Charter city basically says you write your own ticket, your own laws. You can have more independence from the state. Right now, as a general law city, we have to do everything the governor asks us to do or the assembly or senate. St Charter cities give you more independence on what your plans are for the future growth or any other thing you want to do in the city. It's very important to have that independence from the state. We know we hear these laws come down and say, you have to do this because it's the law. As a charter city, you have more say in the matter. It's very important we start moving in this direction because the state seems really bent on taking over local communities and forcing their will on us. And we just can't stand for that any longer. Thank you, Mayor Velasquez. Candidate Casey. Well, I believe that charter cities can be good, but it's all based on how well written your charter is. I have read stories about some cities and their charters and how uh, it created uh, opportunities for corruption among some of the council members who suddenly gave themselves huge salaries. It places, it, you know, it places, a, it changes the balance of power within the city. Right now we're in a council uh, manager form of government with a weak mayor and the city manager pretty much is the CEO. Uh, a charter city can change that to where the, the mayor is suddenly in charge of everything. I, I just, I also understand that there are some ramifications about not being a general law city, about some of the things, funding that you may miss out on. Um, so I think it's something that has to be weighed very carefully and decided if it's right for our, our town. Thank you, Candidate Casey. We will now be moving on to question three. Water pipes in the downtown area are continually breaking and the city keeps tearing up the streets and patching small segments. How are you going to fix the system? We will begin with candidate Casey. Well, I have been watching this with great interest because I wonder how much it costs each time they have to come out to, for the next break. And my understanding is there's been well over 30 breaks in the last three years alone. The pipes are over 100 years old and they do need to be entirely replaced. It is complex, it is very, very expensive, but it's infrastructure that we're going to have to deal with and we're going to have to replace completely so that we don't have teams out in the middle of the night working so hard just to try to you know, fix a, a break. Um, I believe the way to do this is to work on infrastructure funding. Uh, the trillion dollar federal fund package that's out there is for infrastructure and roadways and transportation and I'd like to see the city aggressively pursuing that kind of funding so we can get this fixed once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Casey. <laughs> Mayor Velasquez. The answer is we are fixing it. We, as I said earlier, went from a point of being nearly bankrupt to paying off debt so we can start using our money to start fixing our infrastructure. 
We're doing many streets right now. There are several more to go. We know these are old lines. We've talked about this for years and the importance of getting on top of the infrastructure. That is happening. Our roads have already gone from a rating of 67% to 74%. My goal is to get us to 85%. We're on our way. And this all comes from good planning. This is why I keep saying we need to take care of our own community first before we keep growing out further and further and further. We do it right, we can get a hold of this, and we're showing that happening now with over $30 million right now allocated to fix infrastructure in the city. And we are getting the grants, and we are getting in line for all the other funding we can get into. And the key of that is to be ready, what they call shovel ready. Well, guess what? We're shovel ready now. Our engineers have been working on this for the past few years. We're ready to go, and we're doing it now. You can see it happening right now on Sally Street. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Velasquez. We will now move on to 45 second candidate response and this time candidates can respond to anything that the other candidate has said in question response time. We will begin with Mayor Velasquez. I, I don't have any response to uh, the other candidate. I just want to go back and talk again about how important it is to plan for our future. You know, we got into these situations in the past by not understanding finances. And I can remember a, a conversation about well, how are we gonna pay for that debt? I said, look, we have no choice but to pay for that debt and get it done so we can begin snowballing this and using our dollars to reinvest in our community. And it's paid off in a big, big way. Unfortunately, it's taken a long time, but when you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, it does take a while, but I'm very proud of what we've been doing. I look forward to continuing what we're doing. And we just kicked off Highway 156, the new four lane, and we're doing Highway 25, they're environmental studies right now. This took a long time Thank to get you. going, but we're there. Thank you, Mayor Velasquez. Candidate Casey. Sure, I just have one quick thing to, that I wanted to point out, and it had to do with the roadway work that's happening now. I know uh, uh, my opponent said allotted funds. Um, we basically borrowed money to, in order to do this road work. Uh, we borrowed, I believe, $20 million in an uh, uh, municipal lease financing. It's a sort of an unusual form of financing, a little on the riskier side, and basically you're leveraging buildings such as your fire departments and other municipal buildings. Um, so it's uncertain to me as to what happens if there should be a downturn in our economy, what happens then? So it's, for me it's a little concerning, but we certainly aren't just paying for everything. It's we're borrowing and we're gonna end up owing 32 million on that 20 million that we've borrowed. Thank you, Candidate Casey. We will now move on. We will now move on to 30 second closing statements from each candidate. We will begin with Candidate Casey. I wrote it for 45, so I'm gonna talk fast. Many thanks to Benita Link and to all of you. Hollister, you have a choice. We can continue down the path that we've been on for 10 years. Lots of housing growth, but no business growth. Negativity and infighting, or we can change course. Get everyone working together to tackle those pressing issues. We face challenges, but there are great opportunities. Working together, we can restore and revitalize Hollister, build a strong and vibrant community with safer neighborhoods, better job opportunities, and a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Casey. Mayor Velasquez. Thank you. It's important to know the truth. Fact is, we didn't borrow money to fix our streets. We're doing it from the cash flow we have now. You can see what happens when people don't know factual information. We do have a choice we need to make. We can keep this out of control growth going or we can start taking our care of our own community first. If we keep going down this path, we're gonna be exactly where we were when I first came to office with the city that was nearly bankrupt. Let's take care of our Thank community you. first. Let's take care Thank of our you. residents first before we take care of developers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Velasquez. All right, we have the Measure R um, discussion. Speaking in favor of Measure R will be Frank Berrigan, and speaking in favor of, of me and speaking against Measure R will be Council Member John Freeman. We will just jump right into our first question. 
and that is how does Measure R protect the existing residents and workers within the 3.5 mile buffer zone? We will begin with Mr. Berrigan. One minute. We will have one minute for this question response period. So we're not going to have an open statement? No, thank you. No. No, okay. Um, so yes on R, um, it puts a three and a half, it places a three and a half mile uh, health and safety buffer zone around Trical, which was strategically planned um, over 40 years ago uh, to place it a away from urban development. As we know, when you have urban development next to a hazardous chemical plant, you expose children, families, um, and workers out there. And right now the plan is to put about 5,000 workers out there and other de developments that could happen. So what Measure R does, it puts three and a half mile buffer zone around Trical, which was originally in the general plan. However, the, the county supervisors were afraid of a lawsuit by the current landowners and the, the developers at that time. Everyone knows they were trying to build a city out there. And at that time, they, they, were, they were threatening to sue the county. So the county backed out of it and they didn't put the three and a half mile buffer zone. Um, later on, when uh, Stradivari came out, to, to try to develop out there. Uh, the county actually hired three county experts and they all said they had to have a, a safety buffer zone out there. Trical also agreed Thank that you. you cannot have people out there near a hazardous, uh, hazardous chemical company. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berrigan. We will now have Mr. Freeman. Thank you. Thank you Bruno, for having this forum. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself as John Freeman and I am a 16 year member of the Bay Area Environmental Health and Safety Group as well as being a city council person. So that gives me, and I worked at Romic Environmental Technologies for our almost 12 years in East Palo Alto, and we had more flammable substances than Trical ever dreamed of having, and if we had a three and a half mile buffer zone, that would take out Stanford, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, <laughs> Google, Mountain View, so th th let's face it, this is, this is not serious. Uh, um, this is just an ordinance, aimed at one, one business, Strada Verde, because he has a competitor who wants to do a similar thing somewhere else and it might hurt him. I would say no, if he's really serious, two businesses can exist. I'll tell you Intel and AMD exist within a mile of each other and they both do fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Question two. Tricol has been operating for 40 years without a serious incident. Why would McGuire Builders in Southern California spend almost $50,000 to establish a buffer? We will begin with Mr. Freeman with one minute. Thank you. Um, the only thing is I can think of is, is that this builder is going to eventually try and buy the Strata Verde property. It will eventually push out Tricol, buy them out. And then you'll have what everyone doesn't want, which is wall-to-wall -wall housing. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Berrigan. So I, wish this, I wish this question would have also, also stated that uh, the Stradivari developers have spent over $700,000 in uh, going against Measure Q and R, and they've also spent over $2 million. Um, on, on Measure N, which they lost by 60% of the residents who did not want this development. However, however, we already know that we've had three county experts say that we should not be developing near a chemical plant, and this would stop all development. I know Mr. Freeman over here would like to say that I'm working for a developer. He's completely wrong. And he's getting that from Anthony Batalla, who we know now, who fought against Measure N and was trying to push this, and now he's getting paid by the developer to work for them. Thank you. Do I get to reply to that? Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, we have candidate response time right now. We will begin with uh, Mr. Berrigan for this, and then we'll move to Mr. Freeman. I think I've already answered um, Mr. Freeman's allegations, false allegations. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I, I don't think they're false. I, 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 Where are the facts? Well, the fact is that you don't There's have no facts. Frank, thank you. Let me speak. Um, okay, so number one, um, <clears throat> the, 
no one's paying me. I have no, I've received no money from anybody. Stradivari hasn't even purchased me a lunch, you know? So I, I, I feel that I'm with the clean hands up here. Um, yes, I am friends with Anthony Botello. You should all be friends with Anthony. He's a good guy. Yes, he's in favor of Stradivari, so am I. Big picture, we need the tax money that Stradivari will provide, okay? <clears throat> Two weeks, two, two weeks ago, Channel 8 News was out at the San Juan Padre School t talking about the lack of AC. $8 million a year in property taxes will buy a lot of air conditioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. We're now moving on to closing statements, starting with Mr. Freeman. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, it's my opinion that a law written against one company it's always a very bad idea, okay? And it comes to bite you in, in the rear end later on somehow down the road. Um, if TriCal is a problem, you can go to the DTSC website to see if there's any NOVs against them. There is not. I've done that homework already for you. You don't have to. Um, and, and so they're running a safe operation. Um, no on R. This, this, is, this is just Frank's manipulation of things to get his way for more housing in Thank northern you. San Benito County, Thank where it's you. not needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Berrigan, 30 seconds to respond. So they talk about Strata Verde and all the marketing material you guys have all received at your house. It states that you're going to be, they're going to be generating $14 million, but the county actually did its own assessment, and it's actually $847,000 to 1.4 million. They've also said that they would build a, a fire station out there, but how much would a fire station cost? $4 million to run it? So where are those extra tax dollars gonna come from if they're only gonna generate 847,000 to 1.4? It's gonna come out of your tax dollars, meaning that there's not gonna be infrastructure for Hollister, San Juan, and other areas in San Juan Batista, like San Juan Batista, Thank there's you. not gonna be for Bitterwater, Thank Jefferson, you. and all the rural areas in our county. Thank you, Mr. Berrigan. Thank you, uh, speakers, for speaking on Measure R. Um, we next have Measure Q with Jenny. Um, so thank you, guys. OK, speaking in favor of Measure Q will be uh, Julio Rodriguez. And speaking against Measure Q will be Supervisor Bob Tiffany. OK. Um, we will actually begin with introductions for this. Um, uh, Supervisor Tiffany, you will have 30 seconds to introduce yourself. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I have 30 seconds to introduce why Major Q will be so devastating to our county for all but the next 30 years. It will gut our ability to attract new businesses and the revenues and jobs they would generate, which in turn will drastically affect the improved services and infrastructure our county so desperately needs. Fixing our roads, providing more law enforcement and fire protection, building parks, and much more, all would be severely affected by Major Q. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you have 30 seconds to introduce yourself. All right. We'll wait on that. Hold on. OK. Sorry. Yeah, no, we'll get you situated. Go ahead. Uh, testing? Does everyone hear me? Yep. All right, yes. Sure. Is it? Yeah. It's working. OK. There you go. All right. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Uh, hello, my name is Julio Rodriguez. Uh, also, uh, I had the privilege to uh, be your former planning commissioner for uh, a while, and I'm also studying at San Francisco State University in uh, urban planning. So I, I actually know a thing or two about the, uh, this measure. Uh, the reality is the measure, the point of this measure is because our elected supervisors cannot be trusted to make land use decisions. That's just the reality. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, now we will begin with our questions. Uh, you will ha each have one minute to respond. Mr. Rodriguez, explain how Measure Q will impact the revenue needs of the county. Well, I didn't know that um, we based our budget off of fictitious numbers. And I have actually the report right here. Um, county Council, they challenged the fiscal analysis. They challenged it. They had another study. Uh, kind of like what Frank Bergen was saying, it's uh, Strata Verde was only going to generate 800,000, at most 1.7 million. It's a wash. 
That's just the reality of, the, of these projects. These developers lie after lie after lie to get their project through. And like I said, I have the facts if you, anybody wants to come and see them. Um, but yeah, the measure, the whole point of the measure is, is to stop out of control growth and to protect our prime agricultural land. Guys, the reality is developers want to develop prime agricultural land. This is a land use issue. So please vote yes on Measure Q. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Tiffany, explain how Measure Q will impact the revenue needs of the county. Well, let me first say this is about commercial development. It has nothing to do with housing. And this is about the unincorporated areas of the county. So this is going to greatly impact the revenue. City, uh, the county is a relatively poor county. We only get 11 cents on the dollar property taxes. We get very little uh, sales tax. We're talking about the unincorporated areas of the county. So the only way we can get more revenue is to bring in commercial development, new businesses for our community in the unincorporated areas of the county. That's why the commercial nodes were identified in the general plan to bring in more revenue. So we can pay for more law enforcement. We can pay for fixing our roads, et cetera. Running the county of San Benito is like running any other business. If you don't have revenue, you cannot provide the services that our population so badly deserves and needs. Major Q will kill the opportunity to bring in new Thank businesses you. because no one is going to go through the process of, of the whole planning process you, and then have to go to a vote of the people. We will go ahead and move on. Thank you. Um, our next question. Supervisor Tiffany, I will start with you. Uh, yes, on Measure Q claims it will benefit agriculture. agriculture. No, on Q claims the measure will damage agriculture. How do you support your position? Virtually every farmer and rancher I have spoken to is strongly against Q. And the reason why, a number of reasons. It's a, it's a property rights issue, number one. It's going to affect property values, which will cause their, their property to be reduced and, and their, make it more difficult for borrowing. It will affect the revenue that the county gets, which will cause us to not be able to maintain the roads and uh, other infrastructure, like water, that the ag people so badly need. Um, they also see it as an impact. They're a business just like anyone else. They see it as an impact on expansion of agritourism, expansion of vegetable packing um, buildings, expansion of technology for ag. Ag sees it just like other business people, and virtually everyone uh, that knows what, how this is going to impact our revenue they see this as badly hurting them in their business Thank of you. agriculture. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez, yes on Measure Q claims it will benefit agriculture. No on Q claims the measure will damage agriculture. How do you support your position? Well, Measure, measure Q protects agricultural land because that's what... So Measure Q hurts developers, real estate firms that want to develop, they want to change the current land use from, say, rangeland, agricultural land. They want to change that zone. They, all they need is three votes. That's all they need is three votes to change to single-family homes, more houses, and then the, the property values exponentially increases in values. These farmers, there's a lot of farmers who, who really do want to farm, and then there's some farmers who are tired of farming, and I get it, they want to sell off their land, that's fine, but the reality is it's developers that want, are going to benefit millions of dollars from if Measure Q fails, and, that, and that's the reality. Each spokesperson will have 45 seconds to respond to the points brought up to the, from the other one, and we will get, begin um, with Mr. Rodriguez. I just want to close off with this. We're talking about um, finances and, and we need money. Guys, I have the articles literally right here. We have two incoming Board of Supervisors who are endorsed by the very people who 
got us in this mistake in the first place. Highway 25 is a perfect example. They took it off the regional transportation report. They lowered our fee, the impact fees from $25,000 to $5,000. Now they're trying to say, oh, well, you know, we need money for our roads. We don't have money because our previous elected officials who now are endorsing the incoming elected officials, do we really trust the incoming supervisors to really make the right land use decisions? Honestly, I don't. And that's why I, I, I tell everyone, vote yes on Measure Q. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Tiffany, 45 seconds. I'm, I'm, I'm basically a business person. I, I've been a supervisor the last two years. I'm, no, I'm not running, so I'm done at the end of this year. Um, the reason why I'm passionately uh, against Q is I know in business that if you don't have revenue, you ultimately will fail. And that's what Q will do. Again, it will, it's, it's basically very simple. If you require every commercial, we're talking commercial projects, not, not housing, every commercial project to go to a vote of the people, no business is gonna come to the unincorporated areas of the county and the county will not have the revenue to provide the services that this community needs. It's that simple. So if you vote yes on Q, please don't call your supervisor and complain about a pothole. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now each of you will have 30 seconds for a closing statement. Supervisor Tiffany. Just take a look at the people and prominent groups within our community, community that are strongly opposed to Major Q. Sheriff Eric Taylor, Fire Chief Bob Martin Del Campo, Superintendent Sean Tenenbaum, the Farm Bureau, unions and working families, businesses, the San Diego County Democratic Party and Republican Party. Just when was the last time that Republicans and Democrats agreed on anything? Every, everyone should ask themselves why. Please, I urge you to vote no on Major Q. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rodriguez, 30 seconds for a closing statement. I guess my closing statement is just to, you know, our opposition is, you know, funded by developers, funded by the, the dump, you know, from Texas. They want to dump all their trash here, you know, so you just follow the money. That's all I'm going to say, guys. Follow the money. So I have it right here, John. Yeah. All right, landfill. Follow the money, John. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate your time. And we will now go back to our content manager, Noe Magana. Thank you all uh, for coming tonight and also for the candidates. Uh, and you guys are the troopers. You guys stayed all night. Uh, thank you for that. And because you stayed all night, I'm going to ask for money. No, I'm just kidding. But really, I am going to ask for money. If you are interested in becoming a sponsor or donor for Benito Link, please come see me. Always appreciate uh, supporting local journalism. And also would like to once again thank our sponsors, Brent Bedman Transportation, Golden Memorial, Phil Foster Pinnacle Organics, Wright Brothers Industrial Supply, Richard Shelton Insurance Marketing, the Rotary Club of San Juan Bautista, SBC Cosmetic Care, and True Value Hardware. And if you want to see uh, parts or all the forum, we will be providing the videos in a upcoming days. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>